Hello and welcome back to the course on deep learning. Today we're finally at step number four, full connection. So what is this step all about? Well, in this step, we're adding a whole artificial neural network to our convolutional neural network. So to all of the things that we've done so far, which are convolution, pooling, and flattening, now we're adding a whole new ANN on the back of that. How intense is that? That is just... That is something, that is definitely something. And so here we've got the input layer, we've got a fully connected layer and output layer. And by the way, the fully connected layer uh, in the artificial neural networks, we used to call them hidden layers. And here we're calling them fully connected layers because they are hidden layers, but at the same time, they're a more specific type of hidden layers. They are fully connected layer. In artificial neural networks, um, hidden layers don't have to be fully connected, whereas in convolutional neural networks, we're going to be using fully connected layers, and that's why uh, they're generally called fully connected layers. And so basically that whole column or vector of outputs that we have after the flattening, we're passing it into the input layer. And here we've got a very simplified example um, just for illustration purposes. And what the main purpose of the artificial neural network is, is to combine our features into more attributes that predict the classes even better. So we already, in our vector of outputs in the, flatten, in the flattened um, result from what we've already done, we have some features encoded in the numbers in that vector. And they can already do probably a pretty good job at predicting um, what, uh, what uh, class we're looking at, whether it's a dog or a cat, or whether it's a tumor or not a tumor, and so on. But at the same time, we know that we have this uh, structure called the artificial neural network, which is designed, which which uh, has a purpose of dealing with attributes and coming up or dealing with features and coming up with new attributes and combining attributes together to even better predict um, things that we're trying to predict. And we know that from the previous part, so why not leverage that? And that's exactly what the plan here is. So how about we pass on those values into an artificial neural network and let it even further optimize everything that we're doing. And so that's what we're going to be doing, but let's look at a more realistic example because this one is a bit too simple. So here we've got a better looking artificial neural network where we have five attributes on the input, then we have, uh, in the first hidden layer, we have six neurons in the second, uh, or in the second fully connected layer, we have eight neurons and then we have two outputs, one for dog and one for cat. And so an important thing to uh, talk for us to talk about here is that why do we have two outputs? We are kind of used to having only one output uh, in our artificial neural networks. Well, one output is for kind of when you're predicting a numerical value, when you're, when you're running a regression type of problem. But uh, when you're doing classification, you need an output per class, except for the exception is when you have just two classes. Like we have two classes here, dog and cat, and we could have just done one output and made it a binary output and said one is a dog and zero is a cat. And that would have worked totally fine. And actually, in fact, you'll see Hadlan do that in the practical tutorials and that's how they'll be structured. But at the same time, if you have more than uh, two categories, uh, for instance, dogs, cats, and birds, then you have to have a neuron per every category. And that's why we're going to practice with two categories in this example so that we know what to expect if we ever have more uh, than two categories. And so what's going to be happening here? So we've already done all the groundwork. We've done the convolution. We've done the pooling and the flattening. And now the information is going to go through the artificial neural network. So let's have a look at how all that all happens. There's the information going through from the very start, from the moment when the image is processed, then convolu convolved, then um, pooled, flattened, and then through the artificial neural network, all four steps. And then a prediction is made. And we'll see how this happens in a moment. It'll be very, very interesting. But for now, let's just say a prediction is made, and uh, for instance, 80% that it's a dog. But it turns out to be a cat. And then an error is calculated. A uh, Well, what we used to call a cost function in a artificial neural network, uh, and we use the mean squared error there, or uh, in convolutional neural networks, it's called a loss function, and we use a um, 
cross entropy function for that. And we'll talk about cross entropy and mean squared errors in a separate tutorial and how all that happens. But for now, let's just say we have a uh, loss type of function which tells us how well our network is performing and we're trying to optimize uh, optimize it or minimize that function to optimize our network. So we the error is calculated and it, then it's back propagated through the network just like we had in the artificial neural networks. It's back propagated and the some things are adjusted in the network to help optimize the performance. And the things that are adjusted are, as usual, the weights in the artificial neural network parts, so the, the blue lines that you see here, the synapses. Then also another thing that is adjusted is the um, feature detectors. So we know that we're looking for features, but what if we're looking for the wrong features? What if this didn't work out because the features are incorrect? And so the feature detectors, those remember those little matrices that we had, um, that uh, the three by three matrices, uh, they are adjusted so that maybe next time it'll be better and let's see what happens type of thing. And But of course it's all done uh, with a lot of uh, science in the background, with a lot of math, and it's all done through a grad a gradient descent with uh, back propagation. So it's all, it's all not just random perturbations, it's actually very uh, thought through how it's done. But uh, nevertheless, the uh, feature detectors are adjusted, the weights are adjusted, and this whole process happens again. And then again, the error is backpropagated. And this keeps going on and on and on, and that's how our network is optimized, that's how our network trains on the data. So, the, and the important, the important thing here is that the data goes through the whole network from the very start to the very end. Then the error is compared, um, so the error is calculated, and then is backpropagated. So, same story as with artificial neural networks, just a, uh, a bit longer because of that whole, for the first three steps that we already had. And now let's have a look at the, the interesting part, the really interesting part. How do these two classes work? Because, or how do these two output neurons work? Because before we've always kind of had one output neuron. What happens when we have two? How does, um, how does this situation of classification of images uh, play out? Well, let's start with the top neuron first. We're gonna start with the dog. Um, how do we, the main purpose what we need to do first is we need to understand what weights to assign to all of these synapses that connect to the dog so that we know which of the previous neurons are actually important for the dog. And let's see how that is done. So let's say, hypothetically, we've got these numbers in our uh, previous uh, layer, previous fully connected, or in the final fully connected layer. And again, these numbers can be absolutely anything, they don't have to be that, they, they can be any numbers, but just for argument's sake, we're going to agree that we are looking specifically at numbers between zero and one, uh, so it's easier for us to argue these things and understand. And one means that that neuron was very confident that it found a certain feature. And zero is going to mean that uh, that neuron didn't find a feature it's looking for. So because at the end of the day, these neurons, uh, uh, like anything else on this from on this left side, is just looking at features at an image. This is already very very processed, but still, it's detecting a certain feature or combination of features on the image, right? Before we in the convolve step, we had kind of recognizable features. In the pool step, they're less recognizable. Then they become even less recognizable in the flattened image, and then they get combined and so on. But nevertheless, this we're talking about here certain features that are present in the image or their combination. So a one, which has been passed, and this is important, has been passed to both the dog and the cat at the same time, uh, to both the output neurons. So a one means that for us, for our argument, it means that uh, this uh, this neuron has is firing up. It's, it's really rapidly detecting that feature that, you know, might be an eyebrow. It might be detecting this eyebrow for, again, for simplicity's sake, is detecting this eyebrow and it's communicating that to the dog neuron, to the cat neuron saying, I can see my eyebrow, I can see my eyebrow. And then it's up to the dog and the cat neuron to uh, understand what that means for them, right? And so in this case, which neurons are firing up? These three neurons are firing up. The eyebrow and let's say the nose, is saying I can see I can see a big nose and I can see floppy ears. So it and it's saying that to the dog and to the cat. And then what the dog and then what happens is we know that this is a dog. So the dog neuron knows that the answer is it is actually a dog. Um, be, because at the end we're comparing to the picture or to the 
label on the picture and it knows that dog. So basically the dog neuron is going to say, aha, so I should be triggered in this case. So these are my neurons. They're telling the, this signal that they're sending to both to me, to the dog and to the cat is actually a indication for me that it is a dog. And throughout these lots and lots and lots of iterations, if this happens many times, the dog will learn that these neurons do indeed fire up when the feature belongs to a dog. On the other hand, the cat neuron will know that it's not a cat, and it will know that this feature is firing up, and this neuron is telling me it can see floppy ears, floppy ears, floppy ears, but at the same time, uh, it's not a cat. So basically, to me, that's a signal that I should ignore this neuron. And, like, and the more that happens, the more the cat neuron is going to ignore this neuron about the floppy ears. And so basically... Um, that that's how, through lots and lots of iterations, if this happens often, so this is just one example, but if this happens often, maybe a 1, maybe a 0 0.8, 0 0.9, maybe sometimes it won't fire, but overall, on average, this neuron is lighting up very often. When it is indeed a dog, the dog neuron will start attributing higher importance to this neuron. And so there we go. That's, that's how we're going to signify it. We're going to say that these three neurons, through this, iterative process with, ma with many, 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 many samples and many, many epochs. Remember, so a sample is a row in your data set and epoch is when you go through your whole data set again and again and again through lots and lots of iterations. This dog neuron learned that this um, eyebrow neuron and this big nose neuron and this uh, floppy ear neuron, they all seem to really um, contribute pr very well to the uh, classification of what it's looking for, and which is a dog. So that's how it works. And again, these ears and nose and eyebrows, those are very, very um, approximate or like very far-fetched examples because by this stage in this whole convolution, convolutional neural network, it is completely unrecognizable what they're looking for. But at the same time, it is something in the features of dogs or cats or whatever you're classifying. And then, so let's move on to the next one. Now we're going to look at the cat neuron. But these, we're going to remember that these weights are, you know, they have, we've sorted out the dog. So the dog is kind of like pretty much ignoring all these other neurons, one, two, three, four, five, but it's really paying attention to what these three neurons are saying. Now, what is the cat listening to? Well, whenever it is actually a cat, right? Um, the, this, is, this is an example of a situation when it's actually a cat. So um, you'll see that this, these three neurons, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, and 1, they're saying something They're saying something to both the dog and the cat, and this is, again, important to remember. So this output signal goes both ways. It's the same, right? It's, uh, it's saying 1 to the dog, it's saying 1 to the cat. But then it's up to the dog and to the cat to decide to, whether to um, take into account that signal and learn from it or not. And both the dog and the cat can see that this is a photo... I should have put a photo of a cat here, but basically imagine a photo of a cat. Both the dog and the cat can see that this is actually a cat. So basically the dog is like, oh, okay, so these whiskers and these pointy triangle ears and um, this small size, I guess, or I don't know, oh, maybe the, these this type, you know how cats have uh, these things in their eyes? Their eyes are like little, they're not circles, they're um, lines or something like that, like cat eyes, basically, these cat eyes, they're definitely not working for me. They're not helping me out predict because every time these neurons light up, the prediction is not what I'm looking for. On the other hand, the cat is like, hmm, that's interesting. Every time these, this one lights up, it, or most of the time it lights up, it matches my expectation. It matches what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm going to listen to this guy more. Then this one, this one, same thing. Every time it lights up, or most of the times it lights up, I happen to get a good, I happen to be rewarded for my uh, prediction because I get it right. It's a cat. Okay, so I'm going to listen to him more. You know, this one, useless to me uh, because he's not actually, you know, like he's um, he's not even lighting up. It's a cat, but it's he's not lighting up. So the opposite is happening. And this one as well, it's a cat, but he's not lighting up, so I'm not going to listen to him. But this one, when he, when, uh, what, what was this, the eyes, the cat eyes light up, we can see, I can see that it's a cat. It, it matches most of the time. So I'm going to learn from that. And I'm going to listen to these three guys uh, more often than not. And so basically the cat is listening to these three and it's ignoring the other five. And that is how these final neurons learn which neurons in the uh, final 
fully connected layer to listen to. So the output le neurons learn which of the fully, or which of the final fully connected layer neurons to listen to. And that's how they understand, uh, basically that's how the features are propagated through the network and conveyed to the output. And so even though these uh, features, of course, don't have that much meaning to them, like floppy ears or whiskers, at the same time, they do have some distinctive, they are a distinctive feature of that specific class. And that's how the network is trained because we also during, remember during the back propagation process, we also adjust the feature detectors. So if a feature is useless to the output, it's going to, it's going to probably be disregarded because this doesn't happen over one or two iterations. This happens through thousands and thousands of iterations. So uh, with time, a feature that is useless to the network is going to be disregarded and replaced with a feature that is useful. And so at the end of the day, in this final layer of neurons, you are likely to have lots of features or combinations of features from the image that are indeed representative uh, or descriptive of dogs and cats. And so then once your network is trained up, uh, then we. This is how it's applied. So this is the next step. Like we've already trained up our network. Well, let's happen. Let's see what happens when the uh, this network is applied. So let's say we pass on an image of a dog. Uh, the values are propagated through a network. We get certain values, and so this time the dog and the cat neurons don't know. They don't have the image of the dog here. They don't know that it's a dog or a cat. They have no idea what it is, but they have learned to listen to what is being shown here, right? They have learned to listen to, the dog neuron listens to these three neurons, the cat neuron listens to these three. And so the dog neuron looks at one, two, three, and says, aha, these are pretty high, so my probability is gonna be high that it's a dog. The cat neuron looks at these three and says, okay, these, this one is pretty high, but these are pretty low, interesting, so my probability is gonna be 0 0.05. And and then, and that's, and that's where you get your prediction. So then your, uh, first choice for this neural network is uh, dog, second choice is cat, and that's pretty much it, so the answer is dog. And same thing happens when you pass an image of a cat, uh, you get new values, and you can see that even though this one's high, these ones are low, and for the cat, this one's high, this one's high, and this one's a bit low. So the probability here might not be as great as previously, but still, you can see that it's a cat of 79%, and so therefore the neural network is gonna vote that it's a cat. And so basically, or the neural network is gonna conclude that it's a cat. Voting is a term that is used for these guys. So these neurons in the final fully connected layer, they get to vote and these are their votes. And again, we are just for argument's sake putting values between zero and one here. These could be any values, but they get to vote and then these weights are the importance of their vote. So this is, uh, these uh, these purple weights are how the dog neuron views their votes, how much importance it assigns to these neurons and the, to those votes, and this is how much importance the cat uh, neuron assigns to these um, the, to the votes of these neurons. And so these neurons vote the dog and the cat based on their learned weights. They decide who to listen to, and then they make their predictions, and then the whole neural network concludes that this is in this case a cat. And then that's uh, and then that's your conclusion. And that's how you get images like this, where you have uh, a cheetah, and then you have a uh, cheetah class with you know like a high high probability. So this is you know the probability that the network has predicted, and these are lows. But these still exist because there's still kind of like a small chance the other neurons are uh, also listening to their voters, and they're saying, oh, maybe it's actually a leopard. And the bullet train, very, very probable. Here, scissors, you know, this one won, but hand glass was very close, second, and then frying pan st stethoscope, because you could see, uh, like, these guys, this this neuron, the scissors neuron, the output scissors neuron, listened to its voters, and it had the predominant vote overall, but then the hand glass had a good outcome as well. So there we go, that's how the full connection works, and how this is all this all plays out together. I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. We're gonna summarize all of this in the summary as well. And I'll see you next time. Until then, enjoy deep learning.